Now sciatica is not something you can diagnose from a scan or a blood test. It's a presentation of signs and symptoms in clinic. The key signs would include unilateral leg pain, which is worse than the back pain, and also pain radiating down below the knee, often down to the foot and the toes. Numbness and pins and needles can also occur in a specific distribution, which is often down the back and the lateral side of the leg. And there'll also be the reproduction of pain with a straight leg raise, typically quite early in range, between about 30 to 70 degrees. And the patient will be very resistant of you lifting their leg any further. We also look out for specific muscle weakness, particularly in the plantar flexors of the ankle, where there may be reduced power or even lack of enough power to create a functional lift in the heel raise position. It's also common to see reductions in dorsiflexion power and reductions in eversion. You also commonly get dampened deep tendon reflexes. So the knee jerk reflex, and also the ankle or Achilles reflex. So many of you are probably already familiar with those signs and symptoms, but for those of you who weren't, those are some of the classic signs and symptoms of sciatica, also called lumbar radiculopathy. Sciatica is a clinical diagnosis with defined symptoms. Any unusual symptoms should elevate suspicion and either a referral, second opinion or further assessment should be arranged. It should also be noted that there is an increased risk of epidural abscess in patients with a history of IV drug abuse and those with immunocompromised health status. Your typical spinal red flags for cauda equina would include bladder or bowel incontinence, urinary retention and leg weakness. I discussed these symptoms of cauda equina syndrome in much more depth with my colleague Mike Grice in a webinar hosted on the Physio channel on YouTube. It's available for free and if you want to find it just look for the PDF in the link from the Teachable platform or visit the Physio channel on YouTube. So what causes sciatica? The sciatic nerve is made up of nerve roots from L4 to S2. The nerves combine to form the sciatic nerve as it exits the pelvis and then goes down the back of the leg. The sciatic nerve itself is the largest nerve in the body at around two centimeters in diameter. The nerve exits the pelvis through the deep gluteal muscles, down by the hamstring origin, then down the back of the leg deep to the muscular tissue and then begins to divide and branch off before crossing the knee where it then divides into more divisions down into the lower leg and foot. Now sciatica is most commonly caused by compression at the nerve roots, most typically at the level of either L4-5 or L5-S1. Less common are the deep gluteal syndromes which occur in the deep gluteal tissues and are most commonly referred to as piriformis syndrome. And this type of presentation is very different as it's more muscular, more peripheral, and more easily treated with manual therapy and exercise. The patient is also much less likely to experience central pain processing changes with peripheral nerve irritation when compared to nerve root irritation. Of all your patients with sciatica, about 10% of them will have a peripheral irritation in the deep gluteal muscles and these patients are often easier to work with. So I'll be showing you on this presentation some strategies for dealing with that pathology, as well as strategies for dealing with the more common and problematic lumbar radiculopathy. All right.
It has been suggested that compression and inflammation are two separate mechanisms of nerve root irritation. The nucleus propulsus of the disc can chemically irritate the nerve and cause pain without the need for compression. And a reduction in nerve mobility from a disc bulge may not directly compress, but may trigger edema and a release of inflammatory mediators. Direct compression of the nerve often leads to more severe motor dysfunction, and it's possible to have muscle weakness and sensory loss without pain. You may have seen this in your clinic when a patient with persistent foot drop comes in after their pain has long since resolved. So they can be often two very different presentations. It's been suggested that there may be a more whole body systemic driver for sciatica, especially in the elderly but it's difficult to draw firm conclusions based on the available studies, so that still remains in question. Other causes may include more rare presentations like spondylolisthesis, tumours and foraminal stenosis.